uh, it is 10 30 i'm going to uh, get started all 10 questions are now graded um, and i'm kind of glad that the class as a whole did pretty good um, out of 51 52 ish you know students um, 13 got an a and then the remaining portion is like half divided you know between b's and c's so i consider that you know actually pretty good um, I also turn on ranking, okay? So when you check your grade, um, everything is ranked also. So if you want, if you're curious, you know, where you stand with a particular homework assignment, exam one, or anything like that, um, you can go check your grade. And when you check your grade, I think you have to go to one particular portion. Um, then it will show your ranking in class as well, okay? Um, it's not required, okay? This class is not gonna be graded based on curve. So you don't have to worry about you know, your ranking. Um, it's just you know, the absolute uh, percentage of points that you have that will determine your actual grade. So for those of you who are curious, okay, you, you have a certain score, you have a certain grade, but you want to see where you stand in the class, um, that's one way to find out. Okay? I also turn on the average, so you can actually see the average for the entire class, you know, for everything that is graded. Yep, go ahead. The recording should be on because I set it on a, I, I set a fuse. <laughs> so it should be on there. Yep. We didn't do a cron job either. A time, a time delay. A time, time delay. Yep. All right. Any questions about the exam? I have to tell you, I can only grade two questions and then I have to take a nap. <laughs> it, it was really kind of straining. For whatever reason, it was really straining to grade the exam. Even with a rubric, I just have to pick one of the items. You know, I have the browser. I have one browser open to look at the, the scanned you know, exams, and then the other one open to enter the grade. Um, so it's kind of more or less mechanical, but it's still kind of straining in a way because there are 52 you know, exams to grade. So the same question, you know, I have to do it 52 times and then move on to the next one. And every time I grade deal two, I have to take a break, you know, like take a nap or something like that. <laughs> so it took me at least five sessions to have the entire thing graded. Um, but it's all done. Um, the one thing I do want to kind of mention is about question number 10. Um, and most of you, you know, have the exam in front of you, or I can pop it up here so I can show you what the exam, what the question is. That's the one about mapping a 3D coordinate into uh, natural numbers. So what I'll do is I'm gonna pop that up here so we can all see the question. And I just want to spend a little bit more time on that one because, you know, I figure out the, the closed form of the equation of the function. So I just want to share that with you guys so that you have that, you know, in case you're interested. Okay, there we go. This is the exam. And it's the last question that I want to kind of mention again. Um, it's this one. There's several things that I want to mention. Um, let me bump up the zoom. I can only zoom in so much, you know, it doesn't let me zoom after a certain point. Okay, so I'm hoping most of you can read this part. Um, um, I want you to define a bijective function, which is, this is actually the killer part of this assignment. A lot of people got, only got half the points because you know, the function that is described was not bijective, okay? Well, okay, I take it back. Uh, the way some people describe the function is not even a function, okay? So let me give you an idea of what is not a function, or what I would not consider a function. So some people will give me a function, you know, function g like this, one, 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 maps to one, yeah. and so on. So this is the general pattern, okay? But this is not a function, okay? If you just work on the first um, 10 numbers, you know, from zero to nine, this is not a function. Why is it not a function? Or you know, why do you think I'm not convinced this is a function? A function needs to map every single element from the domain to something in the codomain. Okay, that's a requirement, that's an absolute requirement. And each element in the domain can only map to one and only one element in the codomain. That's a requirement to be a function. So if I see this pattern here, then I will ask, 
Now what happened to this coordinate? It's not on the list. Yep. But with only the first uh, nine, uh, ten mappings, like uh, you don't, we could just be using a very peculiar mapping scheme. That is always possible. Okay, <laughs> that's always possible. However, you know, it's not. Um, it is not definitely not showing the bijective nature, or, or not showing it is a function. And then on the other side, you know, it's um, so the. And also based on what we talked about in class, you know, this is not the way you know I did it in class. It's not the, the scanning motion either. Yep. Go ahead. The only thing is, like, because I'm reading over your mm -hmm. stuff right now, you specifically asked us not to define the closed form just to give you a set of two tuples. Like yes. Need, yeah. So, like, a couple like of the grading criteria seems a little mm -hmm. odd to me, and I'm not just because it says assuming g is a function, like the function is a function. It, it, how are we supposed to show you the function because we're just giving you a set of two tuples? Um, or three tuples, as it were. Okay, so the way we do it is, there are several ways to do it. You know, uh, Remember how I did the 2D to 2D natural number to just natural number mapping? <clears throat> so in this case, you know, it will be 0, 0, 0 maps to 0, 0, 0, 1 maps to 1, 0, 1, 0 maps to 2, um, and then we have one zero zero maps to three, okay, and then you move on to zero zero two, zero one one, and so on. Um, so there has to be a particular way, a particular pattern to show me that you know every single coordinate in three D is systematically mapped to a natural number, because otherwise you know I cannot see that it is actually a function. Now, if you remember, the way we did, did it in 2D was like this, right? 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and so on. So even though this is really just a sample of the first 10 numbers, it does show the approach is extendable to you know, the entire two-dimensional space. And also, you know, there's a number on each particular cell and it has to be a unique number because we keep increasing the number. So that means you know, this is, without proving it, it is um, convincing it is a bijective function. As opposed to the one one zero 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 one one, you know, which will go like this, right? So that will go like the zero, one, two, three, four, and so on. Then what happened to all the other pixels? They're not numbered. Now, you're absolutely right, you know, since we only work up to 0 to 9, it is possible, you know, that, you know, this turns out to be 10, and this turns out to be 11, and they can be mapped as well. But it's not clear from the first 10 examples that that is the case. So that's why, you know, that's why, you know, I, I, when you look at the grade, you, know, you will find, you know, the, grade, you know, the grading criteria, you know, in terms of a rubric, and that's, you know, what I use to grade this one. So what I want to do today is to talk about the closed form of this. In other words, you give me the x, y coordinate of a particular pixel, I can give you the natural number. Okay. So we'll talk about you know how to get this going first, and um, <clears throat> and I think all of you can do this. Okay. You just have to kind of think about it in a systematic way to come up with a closed form. How many people already figure out the closed form for two-dimensional mapping? Nobody. Very good. Okay, because otherwise, you know, it'll be kind of like a boring you know, lecture. At least a part of today's lecture is going to be boring for that person. So what I'll do is I'm going to try to do as much on the projector as possible. Okay, so this way it's all going to be recorded. So I have I have an excuse to use it in the final exam. <laughs> <laughs> and guess what? I still have it here. Okay, so this is from way before. Okay, so let me just kind of change the columns a little bit because it's easier to see when they're kind of like at the corner. And I can bump up the, the font size like that. Okay, so I want to see if there's a particular pattern that I can use in order to figure out, okay, so how do we number you know, these particular cells? 
Now, whether you count in this way or in the opposite diagonal way, it really does not matter, okay? Because it, it boils down to we're still scanning in a diagonal fashion, and then we move on to the next diagonal line. All right, so you can see that we start with the corner. And, you know, this is basically 0, 0 as a corner, as a coordinate. Um, this is 0, 1. This is 0, 1. This is 1, 0. This is uh, 0, 2, 1, 1. And this is uh, 2, 0, 0, 2, and so on. Okay. So do you see any particular pattern? Okay, let's, let's take a look at these numbers, okay? 0, 1, 3, 6, 10. What do you think the next one is going to be? Even without looking at the rest of the, of the spreadsheet, what do you think is going to be the next number? 15. 15. And then the next one is going to be what? 21. 21. 28. And then what? 28. 28. 36. And how did you figure out this is? Hmm? Let's see. So... Okay, 5, 6, five, 7, six, 8, seven. 36, and then what? 45. This is uh, 55, and so on. So you guys are already starting to notice a pattern. What is that pattern? It's adding one each time you go down. The difference is uh, one more than the previous pair, right? Okay. <coughs> In other words, when you look at the difference between these two, it's only one. When you look at the difference between these two, it is two, three, four, five, six, and so on. Okay, so there's definitely a certain pattern to it. But that pattern has to do with the way we scan it. Because when you look at this number here, um, it is the starting point of this particular diagonal line. Okay, but how many things are in that particular diagonal line? Two things, right? And that's why you know, this one starts with three. But this diagonal line has one, two, three items. So when you add three to three, you get six. This one has four items. Adding six to four, you get 10. This one has five. And when you add five to uh, 10, you get 15, and so on. So there's definitely a pattern to it, okay? Now within a diagonal line, it is pretty easy to figure out what the number should be for a particular cell. Okay, so let's say we're dealing with this particular diagonal line. Okay, <coughs> so the way you figure out you know, the coordinate is this is 15, so you just have to look at the um, y coordinate of the cell and use it to figure out what is the number for this one. Okay, because this is the first one, this is the second, this is the third one, so this one is going to be you know, 17, right, and so on. So there's definitely a pattern to it. So the next question is, how do we get a closed form for something like this? That is the question. The other thing that you might have noticed is if I look at the coordinates of these things, if you look at the coordinate of this one, this is an easy one, okay? What is the sum of the x and y of this particular coordinate? Zero. Zero. When you look at these two, is there anything, any pattern that you can tell me about the coordinate, the x, y coordinates of these two pixels. One is the same. They add up to one, right? Okay. And then when you when you look at these three, they add up to two. Yep. And then these add up to three, and so on. So the sum of the x, y of a co of a particular pixel tells you which diagonal line it belongs to. So this, I count that the diagonal lines like this is the zero diagonal line. This is the first. This is the second, this is the third, and so on. Okay? So that means if I want to, you know, I can do some calculations like the following. Okay, so I'm going to open a new spreadsheet here. And in the new spreadsheet, I have, you know, the x coordinate and the y coordinate of the pixel that I want to deal with. And now I want to define fxy, which is the mapping from the 2D natural numbers to a single natural number. Okay? So this is 0, 0, and this one is 0. And we can either pick it to be, you know, start with x or start with y. So I'm going to use this particular way to arrange it. So we're going to, um, sorry? So this will be um, 1, 0, because 1 in the x, 
Okay, so we have 1, 0 being 1, and then we have 0, 1 being 2, and then we have 2, 0, 0, oops, 2, 0 being 3, uh, 1, 1, 4, and then we have 0, 2, 5, and so on. Now I can do this by hand just by looking at the picture and keep scanning. But I want to develop a closed form for all of this stuff here. So the question is, you know, can I find a particular way to do to deal with the closed form? So what I'll do is I'm going to um, so I will first, you know, uh, f figure out what is the diagonal line. Um, remember, this is the zeroth diagonal line. This is the first. This is the second. This is the third, and so on. But how can I figure out which diagonal line I'm talking about from the x, y coordinates? I just have to add them together. Is that making any sense? Okay. So we'll go ahead and add those two. Okay. So we will basically just say, let's add this cell to this cell, and that's the diagonal line. Now, why is the diagonal line so important? Because this is the first one. There, there are no diagonal lines before that, so the offset is going to be a zero. This one has one diagonal line before that, and it has an offset of one. This one has two diagonal lines before that, so the offset is one plus two, so it starts with three. Is it okay? More or less? Yes. Okay. All right. But how do we come up with a closed form of the offset to start a particular diagonal line? So uh, let me use a mouse pad here. The offset to diagonal line n is 0 plus 1 plus 2 plus blah, 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 all the way up to up to n, okay? So now the question is, does this have any closed form? And I Yep, yep, that's the closed form. So it is almost like n squared divided by 2 because it looks like a triangle, but it's not quite like that. It's n times n plus 1, and then the whole product divided by 2, okay? But this is helpful because now I can actually use that information in order to figure out the offset to start a particular diagonal line. So I'm going to use this okay, and put it into my spreadsheet here. So I would just say this is offset to, okay, I'm going to shrink it a little bit because it's too big, using up too much space. Uh, offset to this particular diagonal line. I will start typing here, and it is, it is n, which is the diagonal line number. So this would be this number plus the same number plus 1 oops, times, fix that here, and then the whole product divided by 2. Okay. And I can just you know, replicate this you know, to all of the other cells, like so. But we are still doing okay so far with um, the development of a closed form equation of mapping a two-dimensional natural coordinate to a single natural number. Are we still doing okay? So now that we know the offset to begin a diagonal line, the actual number within a diagonal line is actually pretty easy. There are two ways to do it, but in this case, if you look at everything that is in diagonal no line number two, okay, how is um, the actual function related to the offset within the diagonal di the diagonal line itself? So look at um, look at this value, these three, and then look at these three values here, and they're off by. You guys know it? Uh, the, y. the y value, right? You, you can add 1 and then y, 
to the offset of each diagonal line, and then you can get to, actually you just get add the offset of the diagonal line to the y value. So that means that f of xy can actually be calculated as follows, okay? So I'm gonna use the offset to, the, to that particular diagonal line and just add the y coordinate to it. Do you see how column F is identical to column C? Okay. So let's work out a few more examples just to be sure. Okay. So we'll go ahead and start on the next diagonal line, which is going to be um, over here. So the next one is going to be 3, 0. Um, within the diagonal line, everything should add up, uh, the x and the y should add up to 3. So the next one is 2, 1, 1, 2, and then 0, 3. So now I want to hand figure out the actual value first. This one should be 6, 7, 8, and 9. And now I rely on the actual formula in the spreadsheet to figure out the rest. And you can see column F and column C are still matching up. Now this is not a proof, this is not a formal proof that the closed form that I have worked out at this point is in fact you know, correct, but this is really convincing that that is really the case. Are we still okay with this? Okay. Now given this particular form, okay, um, so I'm just going to switch back to my um, no mouse pad here. All right, so the actual equation is f of x, y is, first of all, we have to get to the offset of that particular diagonal line. That offset is n, whoops, x plus y times x plus y plus one, and then the whole thing divided by two. This will give me the offset to the entire diagonal line. And then after this, I just have to add y to the whole thing, and that becomes you know, f of x, y. That's the, that's the closed form equation to go from the 2D natural number coordinate to a single natural number. <coughs> Next question is, is it reversible? Can I reverse back from a single natural number to the coordinate, to a unique <coughs> coordinate using this particular system? Now, if you just look at the picture, it seems to be kind of instinctive that you can you know, reverse because every single cell has a unique number. So if you point, if you give me a particular number, I can look up and find out, oh, this is where the number is, and then I can find out the x, y coordinate uh, corresponding to that number. But when you look at the equation, is there a way to reverse it? Okay, so let's, let's take a quick look here. All right, so if we carry out the actual multiplication, um, then we have x squared, Okay, so this is x squared plus 2xy, okay, because you know, there are two of those here, plus a y squared, and then plus that 1x, and then plus that 1y, because of this 1 here. And we want to divide everything by 2 plus y. And I will go ahead and put that plus y into here. And to put that plus y into here, I'm going to multiply this one by 3, then we can get rid of that plus y. Are we still doing OK so far? Okay. <coughs> and that becomes the, the closed form of the equation, you know, with, you know, kind of simplified. This is the simplified version of the closed form. So if given this number, can I reverse back to the corresponding x and y? Well, there's only one equation, and there are two unknowns. So unless I give you extra um, constraints, this cannot be done. Yep, if you know that they are natural numbers, then you can constrain it and say, OK, now we have a unique solution. That's right. Yep. So we'll talk about this one next time, okay? I'll let you guys kind of think about it a little bit and see if you can solve the equation, okay? Um,
but intuitively, it does make sense that it is reversible. Okay, there's a there's an inverse function to this L. We go from one single natural natural number back into the x and the y, just because you know if, when you look at it graphically, you, it is spanning the entire two-dimensional space with unique numbers. So when you give me a particular number, I should be able to pinpoint where that number is in the 2D space. All right. So are there any questions about this one? No questions? Okay. If there are no questions, are there any questions about refutation resolution, which is your homework assignment? No questions? I think some people have turned it in already, so I think it is enough, yeah, there's enough material for you guys to start with your homework assignment. It should be that hard, right? Sorry? It shouldn't be that hard, right? It's very mechanical, okay? You know, so it's tedious more than, you know, tricky. It's really a lot of, there's a lot of tedium because you have to match the uh, CNF or the components of a CNF and say, oh, I can see that this term has a Q and this term has a not Q. And then you try to combine those two, but sometimes you know the, uh, the result is already in the CNF, so it's not gonna help you because it's already there. So the, the trick is, can you do it systematically so that every single time you discover a new match, it is giving you a new result. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to retest the ones that you have tested already. Yep. And then, so if you come up with a false, then the entire thing is false. Correct. Which disproves, no, which proves your theory. Exactly, because when the negation of the theorem yeah. putting into the CNF is leading to a contradiction, that means the non-negated version of the theorem has to be true. Which also means that if you cannot falsify the CNF, that means that the theorem that you originally had cannot be proved. Yep. Well, I want to make sure. Thank you. Yep. Mm -hmm. That's right. That is the correct interpretation. I wouldn't say falsify, but you know, would not come to a conclusion of false. Yep. Falsify seems to suggest uh, <laughs> <laughs> it, it must be has a out here. has a slightly different connotation. <laughs> <clears throat> All right. So that's good. Okay. So now we can move on to predicate calculus or predicate logic. So what we have done so far with proposition, propositional logic, okay, let me just kind of go back to the homework assignment here. Okay, so this is our resolution homework assignment. Do you see any for all or there exist symbols here? Nope. There are no quantifiers in propositional logic, which limits the application of uh, propositional logic. So let's go ahead and go back to the main slide here, and then we'll start with predicate calculus or predicate logic here. Um, these are the topics in the curriculum, so I have to go over all of these things. Some of these we have talked about already, so it's not like you know it's a new thing. Um, we'll start with this particular slide. Why do we need to talk about predicate logic when we already have propositional logic? Isn't that enough to prove theorems and work with logic in general and stuff like that? And the answer is mm, not real. Okay. Does the student learning objectives tell us we have it? Sorry. Does the student learning objectives tell us we have it? Yes. <laughs> well, that's a that's a part of it, and then the other part has to do with you know whatever four year university you transfer to would assume that you know this stuff already. So you better know it before you know you transfer. Okay. So what I'll do is I'm going to jump to a particular point here. <clears throat> so a typical proposition represented in lowercase p to s is a fact. That that's fine, except that there are two types of facts that we need to deal with. Okay. And on a daily basis, we use this all the time. And I just used it. What did I say? We used it. All the time, okay? So all the time is actually a quantifier, right? Okay, now it's an over-exaggeration all the time because, you know, we don't start every sentence with every, all, always, none, none, no, you know, some, okay? But, you know, we do use it a lot, okay? So think about what some, something that you have said earlier today to someone else, okay? 
and think of you know, what, qu which quantifier you use. Does anyone want to give me an example? I'll give you one example. I'm pretty sure it's on some of your minds. Okay? And, you know, tax homework is always so tedious and boring. Okay? That always is a quantifier. Okay? Now, we have already touched on quantifiers before. And which two quantifiers have we talked about? Those are the only two, by the way. Yep, we talked about this symbol, right? And this is which one? This is for all, okay? And this one is there exists, okay? So when I say, or when you think your tax homework assignment is always tedious and boring, you're actually using this one. For all x such that x is a homework assignment, such, such that x is a tax homework assignment, the predicate is, is boring and tedious. Okay? So if you want to sp spell it out, then it is saying for all x such that, you know, um, x is an element of tax assignment, implies P of X and P is a predicate okay a predicate is kind of like a proposition it is stating a fact but it is parameterized so if you think about this in terms of subroutines a proposition is like a subroutine that has no parameters it is just doing one thing and is doing the same thing over and over again a predicate is like a proposition except it is parameterized in other words, you can give it a, an argument. So in this case, the argument is this x here. But in order for me to get to this x, I already know that this x is a tax homework assignment. So this predicate can now basically have a particular meaning. So you can assign meanings to p in this case. So in this case, you know, p of x basically is the same thing as saying you know, uh, x is tedious and boring. Or whatever you want to call it. But that is basically saying tax homework assignment is always tedious and boring. I feel like that's a fair factual statement. Well, I'd say as if, you know, this is this is how you this if that is what you want to state, this is the way to do it <laughs> using quantifier in predicate dot calculus. But is it helpful? Is this a big step forward compared to propositional logic. Why is it useful? Well, you know, there's an example in this slide here. Okay. So the example is right here. Prop propositional logic has no provision to handle quantifiers. In other words, you cannot say everyone, someone, okay, no one. Okay, you cannot state anything like that. So you can state tech is a professor in propositional logic because it is just a particular fact. You can also state the fact that professors are supposed to know the subject matter. But there's no way to connect these two facts in propositional logic. You guys see what I'm saying? Okay. There's no way to connect these two because you cannot say that tech is a professor and therefore you know, the following also applies. Because like propositional logic, you can only prove things as statements independent of themselves, like of other things. Right. Like they're just proof based on the truth of that particular statement. There's no way to actually connect them to another statement. Right. There's no way to connect you know, the, the statement or the fact that Tech is a professor to the other fact, which is professors are supposed to know the subject matter. Now, when I say you know this particular fact, professors are supposed to know the subject matter, how do you state this in propositional logic using logical symbols? It all has to do with the word supposed to or the phrase it was supposed to, right? Okay, knowing the subject matter is one statement, okay, it's one fact. Um, being a professor is another one. So how do we connect these two? Yep. You'd say like professor implies knowledge. Exactly. Matter. Yep, that's exactly it. Being a professor implies that person should know the subject matter. Okay, so 
that's exactly it. But in propositional logic, we have no provision to make you know, connections to you know, from you know, a single instance to something that is universal. And that's the limitation. And that's why we need to move on and start to talk about predicate calculus or predicate logic. So the next slide talks about you know revisit something that we have talked about before. Okay? So what we what we want to do is to state the correct outcome of specific algorithms. So I'm not even interested, interested in expressing the algorithm itself. I'm only interested in stating the correct outcome of an algorithm. So in this particular case, I have a search algorithm to consider. Given any of an array A and the value key, uh, value K, which stands for key, defined, how do we express that a search algorithm is correct, that a result R, okay, as a variable or a return value, is true if and only if there is at least one element in A that has a value of k. Okay. Now, the English version of this, of what a search algorithm is supposed to do, is fairly easy to understand. But can we express this using logic? That is the next question. Okay. Sloppy way number one. R is one if and only if there's at least one element in A with a value of k. Okay, that's one way to say it. But we can change the element of A so that it is k. So this is not a proper way to state the correct outcome of a search algorithm. Okay. How many people understand what this means? From the lack of response, I'm going to yep, go ahead. Question or just affirming that you understand you, what that means? Just affirming. just affirming. Okay, very good. But I cannot move on until I have confirmation from every single student. So for all x, such as x is a student in this class, I need that predicate of confirming to be true in order to proceed, right? Okay. Using quantifiers in normal statements. All right, so I'm going to give you an example in this case. So let me switch to my mouse pad here. <coughs> All right, so I will do search algorithm number one, okay? Given an array A with at least one element, um, return a value of true if and only if at least one element in A is has a value of K. All right. So that's a description. Okay. Let's say your homework assignment from CIS 360 has this <coughs> description here. Given an array A, okay, so your professor says, okay, I'll give you, I'll pass in the parameter, which is an array. I will also pass another parameter, which is k. I want this subroutine to return true if and only if at least one element in a has a value of k. And that's the only description, OK? This is how I will write that subroutine. I'm going to use c here, OK? So search. And then let's say we're dealing with an array of integers, you know, just for simplicity purposes. So we have you know, int um, array as a pointer. Okay, and a value key that we are searching for. This is what I'll do. I'm going to say p array, which is the base of the entire array. I'll change the first element to key, and it always return true. That will fit that requirement, right? Because by the time I return, the first element has the value of the key. No one says that I cannot do that. Is that making any sense? No, so you can't do that, but that doesn't prove the search algorithm now. It does not meet what you would expect a search algorithm to be doing. Because instead of telling you whether he is in the array that I was given with, I change the array so that it has it. <coughs> that's, that's not a search algorithm, right? Okay, so something is not right about the description because if this 
<clears throat> okay, so if a professor uses this sloppy description of a search algorithm to describe a search algorithm, and you turn in the code that I just did, logically speaking, technically speaking, um, the professor has to give you full credit because the professor never said with any extra constraint that you cannot change elements in array A. Is that making any sense? Okay. So the way to change that, at least in coding, I'm hoping most of you still rem remember this stuff here, that will help. Because now the array A, or you know, the pointed to the array, <coughs> cannot be changed. Or whatever content that is pointed to by the array cannot be changed. So that would be you know, one way to fix it. Now obviously, since this is C, you know, if I want to be actually correct, I have to pass N as well, N being the number of elements in the array, because in C, there's no way to pass the size of an array just by passing the array itself. So just to be complete here. All right, so sloppy way number one is not helping, it's not working. So let's try to make it a little bit better. Okay, this is number two, as refinement of number one. It's still sloppy. <clears throat> R, is R, which is the return value, is supposed to be a one if and only if there is at least one element in A with a value of K without changing the value of any elements in A. Okay, so we got that covered now. Okay. But now how do we express this using logic? You know, using the less than, greater than, equal to, you know, all the other symbols that we have worked with already up to this point. And this is one way to do it. Okay, the algorithm behaves correctly if and only if R has the following value. R is going to have the value of, oh, I think I missed a close, uh, close parenthesis here. Okay, so let's take a look at this one here. This is more or less a shorthand. Let's take a look at this part. It says there exists um, an I such that I is a natural number between zero and bar A bar, which is the number of elements in A minus one which basically says you know, as long as i is a valid index into the array. Okay, so this is saying there exists there exist at least one i such that i is a valid index into the array. And we also want this to happen. So we want v, lower, uh, v subscript i to be equal to k. So we want a, the value of a particular element to be the same as k. That's corresponding to the first way of doing things. This is the second one. This is the second one, and it has two statements. There's a conjunction here. So the first, the second component, which is this part here, is defining what v subscript i is. It's basically saying for all, okay, so this time we use a for all symbol here. It says for all i such that i is a valid index in the array, we define v subscript i to be the value of a bracket i when the algorithm starts. Okay, so this is the initial condition. And then we have the other part which is here that defines you know, what r is supposed to be. And this time we can now say that, okay, from the start value of a bracket i, this has to be true in order for r to return true. Are there any questions about this one? Now, without using ex, you know, uh, the uh, quantifiers for all and there exist, how would you describe the correct outcome of a search algorithm? That would be pretty hard, right? Because then you have to spell out everything. But with for all and there exist, you don't have to spell out everything. You just have to say there exists at least one of these things, or you can say for all, you know, everything that matches this criteria, <coughs> the following has to be true. Yep. So how do you know that uh, what you have written there is logically sound? It's not logically sound. Okay, logically sound has to do with 
whether it matches reality or not. This is just you know what I think a search algorithm should do. So there's no like proofs. You don't have like how to. Is, is there like a way to see if you made any mistakes with like that? Or is that just like a model? I, I see your question. You basically have to look at you know um, test cases of a search algorithm and say okay you know what kind of search what kind of algorithm can meet this requirement and then see if all of those are valid in search algorithms which is kind of going backwards because this by, this is trying to define what a search algorithm is supposed to do so if you get the definition of a search of a particular algorithm wrong to begin with then everything is going to you know kind of be wrong because you know, the actual, the, the statement that defines the outcome itself is wrong. So then your algorithm can you know, definitely be wrong in that case. So that's why you know, this has to be, this has to be carefully crafted to make sure that it does reflect what you want from the search algorithm. That's a good question. Okay, any other questions about this? Okay, the next example which shows you know, why it is important to talk about um, quantifiers is how do we express an array is already sorted or not? Okay, this is all I want to know. Okay, I'm not sorting an array, an array, I'm just trying to find out whether it is already sorted or not. Okay, <clears throat> this is sloppy way number one. R, which is the return value, is one if and only if a bracket i is less than or equal to a bracket i plus one. Okay. And just with the first one, the easy way to get this done is to initialize, reinitialize, overwrite the entire array with one value, maybe zero. That would be this requirement. Okay. And then we can return to it. Does everybody see what I'm saying here? Okay. Give you an example. So let's say somebody gave me this array here, 2, 3, 5, 2, 10, 20, which is almost completely sorted. And my job is to say, is it sorted or not? Okay, that's my job. But the description of what I'm supposed to do is just this, okay? I'm supposed to return a 1 or a 0 in R, and I'm supposed to return a 1 if and only if a bracket i is less than a bracket i plus 1. So what I'm going to do is this. I will just go ahead and reinitialize the entire array to say 2s. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And then I say, OK, now we can return 1 for sure. But is that checking whether an array is sorted or not? It's not checking. I'm overwriting the whole thing. <laughs> But it does meet that requirement. OK, so that is not working. <clears throat> if that is not working, and besides, I did not even bound you know, what, is, uh, what is the range of i. I can just look at the first two, right? Two is less than three, I'm done. Because I only want to consider when i equals to 0. So it's not clear. You can argue with your professor a lot if the description is like this. So we'll use description number two, which is a little bit less sloppy. It is still kind of sloppy. R is an array. R is the return value. It is one or non-zero if and only if a bracket i is less than a bracket i plus one. And this time I bound i to be to start from zero, and it goes all the way to the number of elements in a minus two because I have to deal with the last comparison. And I also state that no changes are to be made to the array. I cannot change the element values in this array. Okay. So once again, I use the previous approach. I basically use this particular component to uh, state the initial value of each element in A. And then I say R is true if and only if for all i between 0 and a bar a bar minus 1, so all for all valid indexes except for the last one, um, the value i or b subscript i has to be less than b subscript i plus 1. So this will establish and make sure that you know, I'm not changing anything in the array. 
Is that okay so far? But if you focus on this part, okay, it will be pretty hard to do this without um, the for all. Because without the for all, you have to spell it out. You basically will have to spell out B0 has to be less than or equal to B1, and B1 has to be less than or equal to B2, and oops, so on and so, so forth, which is really sloppy because it doesn't really say, OK, but what, what about all the stuff in between? Because the last entry is going to be B subscript bar A bar minus 2 is less than or equal to B subscript bar A bar minus 1. But what about the stuff in between? Maybe I can skip a few things because it doesn't say anything here. But using the for all symbol, you know, the one that is already on the projector, there's no way I can skip anything because it says for every single i between 0 and bar a bar minus 2, it has to be true that v subscript i is less than or equal to v subscript i plus 1. Are you guys still following me? OK, all right. And this one we have seen many, many times already, so I will just kind of briefly go over this one. How do we specify the correct outcome of a sorting algorithm? In this case, I am going to change the content of the array to an in-place sort so that it is going to be sorted after the algorithm is done. Okay? Now, this one is a little bit tricky because if this is the input of the array and I'm allowed to make changes this time, I can now reuse the, uh, the cheating interpretation <coughs> and say, oh, this is, this is my sorting algorithm. Okay? Because this time I am allowed to change the content of the array. What is the problem of you know, considering going from this array to this array as a sorting algorithm? Why is it not sorting? It's not the same anymore. Not the same. OK, very good. What about this then? <clears throat> we have 2, 2, 3 in the initial array. Okay, let's say three, three, th 2, 2, 3, 2. Okay? And then in the final array, I have 2, 2, 3, 3. Why is this wrong? You do not have all of this. Not all of the elements are the same. Not all the elements are the same. Okay. Or included in the original array. Okay. Then how do you express that? How do you express that every value that was in the original array is only occurring in the final array once and only once? Can you express them as sets? Mm. Expressing what as a set? You're getting close, okay? You know, I like the idea of a set, but ex but which set are we talking about? Are we having a set of the values of in the array, or are we having a set of the indexes of the array? Values, not indexes. Well, that's not going to be very helpful, okay? Because in this case, remember, in a set, we don't have duplicate values. So, in the original one, we have two, three in a set. But in the final form, we also only have two, three in a set. That's not going to save us from this. Yeah. Well, if we do it by indexes and we just say that the cardinality of the set is the same, that doesn't necessarily mean the set. Oh, but, but we can start with the concept of a set of the indexes, and then we do, we'll use some concept that we have talked about already. Go ahead. Correct. Something to that effect. Okay, so the question is now how do we state that? Okay, let's go ahead and pass the row sheet, and this time I actually remember. <clears throat> okay, so let's think about it a little bit. We'll start with a simpler example. Okay, so we'll start with 2, 5, 3 in the initial array. This is index 0, index 1, and index 2. After you sort these three numbers, obviously, in this case, we should have 2, 3, and 5. Right? OK. So it's pretty easy to say, oh, OK, what used to be in at index 0 is still at index 0. Whatever was in index 1 is now in index 2. Whatever was in index 2 is now in index 1. And there's a map, right? But that mapping is not a mapping of the value. It is a mapping of the indexes. Okay? 
when I talk about mapping, what term, well, does it remind you of a term that we have been using a lot lately, even today, early in the lecture? What is, what is a mapping? Starts with an F? It's a function, right, okay. So the question now is, can we define this mapping using a function? In other words, we want to define a function that maps from the valid indexes, in this case, 0, 1, and 2, to just 0, 1, and 2. Okay. And this mapping is going from the initial value to the final value. You doing okay so far? So in this case, we do have a function like this. In fact, I can start out exactly what is in this particular function, because 0 gets mapped to 0, 1 gets mapped to 2, 2 gets mapped to 1. That's my function. Is it injective? It is injective. But first of all, is it a function? Is everything in the domain mapped to exactly one element in the codomain? Yes. Yeah. Is it injective? Everything maps to something unique? Yeah. Is it surjective? Yes. It is bijective. Now, if you apply something like this to an array with duplicate values, it will still work. It's just that if there are multiple functions that can work in that case. Okay, are we ready to erase this? Is that okay? Does anyone want me to not erase this? Okay. See, I use anyone. That is a quantifier. When I use the word anyone, which quantifier does it map to? There exists. There exists there exist x such that x is a student in this class and predicate is not one me to erase it. That's what I said. Okay. So let's look at duplicate values 2, 2, and 3. Well, let's make it not sorted. 2, 3, 2. Definitely not sorted and the elements are not unique. After we sort it, it doesn't matter which two we move around and how we move it, it ends up with two, two, and three, right? So there are two functions that can you know, do the same thing here. The first function is going to be zero maps to zero, uh, one maps to two, and two maps to one. That would certainly work, right? Because we are just saying, oh, this three goes here and this two goes here. But I can have a much more elaborate function. I can, I can move the twos you know, unnecessarily, and no one can say that I'm wrong, okay? Because I can move this two over here. Oops, there we go. And then I can move this two over here. And then we move the three over there. So, but nonetheless, in each case, the function f is bijective. Are we, are we doing okay so far? So this is our ticket to, de to define a sorting algorithm or to define the correct outcome of a sorting algorithm. Yeah. So let's, let me just kind of scroll on the screen a little bit because the answer is down there. All right, so it's a little bit longer, but this time I'm using a particular set n to represent all the valid indexes. So n is a set of elements, and each element is an element of the natural numbers, and it has to be less than or equal to bar a bar minus one, which basically just means n is a set of valid indexes into the array. m is kind of like n, except it doesn't have the last one, because it is missing bar a bar minus one, because it ends with bar a bar minus two. Okay, so they're, they're only really here for you know, convenience purposes. So what I want to do is to define, you know, I want to say that if the sorting algorithm does work correctly, this is what needs to happen. Uh, there has to be a function, f, which maps from n to n. Okay, so we are talking about the entire set of all valid indexes. And this f has to be bijective. And furthermore, I would also use this to define it. 
The first one is really just to bound and basically say this is how we, um, every single element in the final array has to map to a particular value from the form. Because V subscript I is the initial value of each element in the array. Is that okay? And then the second one is to define the actual ordering of elements after the sorting algorithm is done. So I use one as a constraint and say, we cannot introduce anything new, we cannot duplicate anything, we cannot remove anything. That's the first one, the one on the left-hand side of the conjunction. And then the one on the right-hand side of the conjunction is actually the one that defines the ordering between the elements. So now you know, we have a proper way to define the correct outcome of a sorting algorithm. Are there any questions about uh, all of this stuff here. This entire slide, the purpose of this entire slide is basically just to make sure that we understand why do we have to talk about there exist, why do we have to talk about for all. You know, are they actually useful? Well, the answer is yes, they are actually useful, not only from the perspective of, oh yeah, this is some kind of abstract math that I will never ever have to use again. This is a way to think about problems. It's a way to think about what is the correct behavior of a program. How many people have encountered this situation at least once with your programming homework assignments in CISP 360, 400, or 430? You think you have read the homework description correctly, you wrote your program, and then on the day before it was due, you read the description again, and you found out, I missed that one part or I misunderstood that one part, and then have to go back and really frantically change your program to meet that requirement. I have done that many times, <laughs> okay? And this is, this is what really what it is. I mean, it's trying to make it very clear what an algorithm is supposed to do. It doesn't tell you how to do it, but it does tell you what qualifies as a correct answer. Are we still okay so far? We're still okay at this point. Then we'll talk about the relationship between predicate logic and propositional calculus. All right, there we go. <clears throat> um, the bottom line is we only have to introduce like a few additional transformation rules or inference rules and we are good to go. The two inference rules that are really important in this case is this one here, okay? The other one is kind of like the converse of this one. But this one is basically saying, for all x such that p is px, is basically the same thing as saying that there there's, it is not the case that there exists x such that px is not true. All right, let's, let's just take a look at this one and see if it does make any sense or not. Let's say in English, okay? So I'm going, I'm going to leave this one on the screen and see if I can scroll it all the way up. And then we'll go ahead and use a notepad, a mouse pad here, to make an example. All right, so we'll align everything right. Okay, so this is this is what we will we'll, this is what we'll do is to. I'm just scrolling all the distraction out of the way. Okay. So what we want to do is to make a particular statement. So make any statement that you want that has a for all thing in it. So any statement that has to do with always, everything, everyone, you know, that's, those are all for all, okay? Think of one, just give me an example. Come on, you guys can think of something. I'll think of one, okay? Every single one of the tax lecture is boring. Okay, we'll use that. So I'll say every um, lecture of tax is boring. Okay. So this is using implicitly using the for all quantifier because it is not saying a particular lecture, it is saying all the lectures, right? 
So now the question is, can I turn this around and use a there exist a negation to, see, to say exactly the same thing? Okay. So what is another way to say that every lecture of text is boring? But, but without using every, always, um, that sort of thing, but instead you, you will say there exist or there, um, at least one, okay? You know, at least one is a good way to say you know, there exist. Um, and also negation. How can we, can we turn it around to not use every but mean exactly the same thing? Okay. I'm not an English major in any way. Go ahead. Exactly. Okay. There is no lecture of text that is not boring. It means exactly the same thing, right? <clears throat> where's the where's the there exist? There is. And then there are two negations. There's one negation to say that does not exist, right? There is no means that does not exist one. And there's the other negation here to negate the boring part. So if you try to map this to the inference rule, we have one negation here, and we have one negation here, and then we have the there, there exist over here. So is everybody seeing the kind of the uh, the meaning of this particular inference rule. Okay. Is that okay? Okay. What about the other one? Okay. The other one is starting with a non-negated there exist, and then we convert it into a for all, but with double negation in this case. So let's think of another example. Okay. So let's go ahead and think of another example that can be illustrated that can be used to illustrate there exist. There exist means, you know, you would use the words like some, okay, someone, sometime, okay, those are all implicitly stating there exists. Someday I just don't feel like going to school, okay? Someday. What? Someday I just don't feel like going to school, which may or may not have anything to do with the previous statement. <laughs> okay, so how do we turn this around and, okay, maybe I should not use the negation here just to emphasize the end result has double negation. So I would just go, uh, I just want to skip There we go. Much more specific, and it is connected to the previous statement of every single lecture is boring. What do people want to say? <clears throat> okay, so can we turn this around and use negation and the for all quantifier instead? So this particular statement, as it is right now, basically says there exists at least one day that you want uh, that I want to skip tax class, right? So can we turn it around and say um, okay? I'll, I'll start with this one, and you guys you guys can refine. It, okay, it is not true that I want to not skip, which is attend tax class every day. Is that saying the same thing, but you're using a very convoluted way of saying it? Okay. So now we have double negation, right? That if the first negation is applied to the every day. Okay, so this negation is applied to the every to to the entire thing here. The other negation applies to the predicate itself, to skip the class or not. But 
more importantly, we also have sum, which is there exist, converted into every. So we went from a there exist to a for all. Yep. And what a uh, refined sentence? Yeah, go ahead. It is not every day that I uh, want to not attend tax class. Okay. It is not every day that I want to not attend tax class. Not. Attend. But attend okay. is the same thing as not skip, and therefore the negation is there. But instead of saying, yeah, it's, it means the same thing, but yeah. If you do not use the word attend and instead just say not skip, then we can clearly see the double negation. The first negation applies to the every, okay? In this case, it's applied to the for all. The other negation is applied to the predicate, which is also here. And then we have the there exist converted into a for all. So we do use all of these things every single day. Just that statement all by itself you do, is already using it. <laughs> Are there any questions about any of this stuff here? Okay. Questions? So now we are starting to talk about some new concepts in predicate calculus or predicate logic. <clears throat> so at the center of predicate logic is you know, the, the word predicate. So the question is, what exactly is a predicate? We already talked about it a little bit earlier. It is basically a proposition that is parameterized. So instead of saying a particular fact about a particular thing, you can now say, you know, P of X, you know, using X as a parameter, and say that X is da 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 da. Am I doing okay? Okay, it's kind of like a function that has a parameter instead of a function that has no parameter. That's basically what a predicate is. It's a proposition that is para parameterized. And as a result of being different from a proposition, the convention is also a little bit different. So the convention to use a symbol to mean a particular predicate is to use uppercase PQRS instead of lowercase PQRS as a proposition or as a variable in a proposition. Um, predicate logic can also incorporate functions like your normal you know, uh, math functions. And then we have the two symbols, okay, one is for all and one is there exist. <coughs> So now that we have talked about all this stuff here, we can now start to talk about what is um, considered a well-formed formula. But now that we are talking about predicate logic, what is a well-formed predicate formula in this case? And it can be defined recursively this way. P is a predicate. And then T1 to Tn are parameters in that formula. Um, T1 equals T2 is a formula all by itself. It is basically establishing the equality of two terms. The negation of a formula is a formula. Okay. This we have this part we know already. Uh, the question mark is basically representing the connective, and the connectives that we have talked about are the same thing as in predicate, uh, predicate calculus here. So that would be a conjunction, disjunction, implication, and equivalence. Okay, those are all the connectives that we have already used in propositional logic. But on top of everything else, we have these two. So phi, in this case, is a formula. And if you use the for all or there exist as quantifiers, then the resulting thing, which, is, which has the for all and the there exist, that is also a well-formed formula. So if you start up with a well-formed formula without the quantifiers, you can add the quantifiers, and that becomes a well-formed formula. And in this case, a term because you know, there are references to terms here. So a term is basically a variable. And also the result of a function can also be a term. So you can apply normal math functions in this case. And that can also be used as a term. And these are the basic changes to what we already know about propositional logic. We're just simply adding this, these additional rules to define a more elaborate type of you know, formulae instead of uh, the previous ones, which are much more simple. Are there any questions? 
this is pretty boring stuff, okay? You know, um, I'm really thinking about using Prolog, okay, in this case, because it, it does connect everything that we talk about here, which is really kind of boring and dry, to something that is programming, okay? I'm pretty sure someone, uh, there exists a student in this class such that itching, that student is itching for programming homework assignments, <laughs> okay? So, it's not like I'm itching to stick my fingers my eyeball. <laughs> um, the, the rest is pretty boring stuff too. But I have to finish at least you know this part. We got about four minutes left. Okay. So the use of quantifiers is also a concept um, to turn free variables into bound variables. Okay. Yep. I have a question. You mm -hmm. said for each student in the class, blah 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 blah. Mm -hmm. uh, how is that different from for all students in the class, there exists a student. When you say the word each, it is already implicit. You implying that it is a for all. Each is actually a kind of strange way to say for all because each is kind of the same thing as every. Each student has to answer the question on his own or her on their own in the test. That applies to everyone. So it's the same thing as everyone needs to answer his or own his or her own question. So each is actually a for all and not a there exists. Does that make any sense? Uh, what I mean is like a uh, a uh, for all wrapped around in uh, every. There, I mean there exists. Okay, so you, it doesn't mean, okay, once you use for all of a particular variable, you cannot use the same thing anymore. Because if you only found a variable once, um, in this case, the for all has already found x. So you can, it's no longer free for the pair exists to find it again. So it can only be found once. And in this case, the for all operator is binding x already to something and cannot reuse it again in the there exists. Okay. Now there are some really kind of interesting examples. Okay, if you look at a p, x, y, yes, x, x, y, okay? And you can come up with certain statements, okay? If you say for all x in I don't want to be politically incorrect here either. Snitches, okay. Star Valley. Okay. If you don't know what this means, it's okay. It is just a set of things, okay? <clears throat> there exists a Y in the bell in the not star valley. Not star. Okay, so the first one is binding x to one element in star value. The second one is binding y to one element in not star value. Now I can state my predicate x, y. So what is that really saying? <clears throat> it's saying every star value hates at least one not star value. Those are snitches, of course, from uh, Doctor Seuss. <laughs> Does that make any sense? But it's not saying every star value you know, snitch hates every non-star value. That not non-star value snitches. Okay, it's simply saying there's at least one that a star value snitch does not like. Does that make any sense? Okay. But it's not the same thing. If, if you reverse the, the their existence for all, they, they mean they mean different things, entirely different things. So if I change these two, so that this one is there exist and this one is for all, it's completely different. Because what this means is of all the star value snitches, at least one hates every single non-star value snitches. 
or whatever the other ones. For all I know, they can like every you know non-star belly you know stitches. But at least one is a hater. <laughs> okay? And when I say a hater, it is not just hating one of the other stitches, it's hating every single one of the other stitches. Is that making any sense? What about the other combination? I'll let you guys think about it. What about you use their exist and their exist here? How does it change the meaning? And what happens when I use for all and for all here? How does that change everything? Okay. This is not the world that you want to live in. <laughs> okay. This is a little bit bearable. Because for all we, for all we know, there may be just one single star belly snitch that hates only one of the non-star value stitches. And then the rest, they all get along. Okay? So this is a kind of more hopeful world as far as Dr. Seuss is concerned. I think I need to go through all the you know, Dr. Seuss folks and start to have a new version that uses the quantifiers on predicate logic and use the same picture. I cannot draw though, I have to recycle pictures from somebody else's. <laughs>